Okay, I'm ready for you whenever you are. One minute away. Yeah. I also have a problem because until just a short while back, there was no electricity. Oh. <laughs> Seven thirty will start, huh? Start this like. The starting. Hello, hi. Uh, welcome to DSS first uh, Monday Fix Goa, and a happy new year to our audience. Uh, we thank you for participating. Through these programs, we bring together perspectives of various issues to keep you engaged, inspired, and sharp. We'll put up our website and contributions uh, link in the chat box towards the end of the program. Today, our discussion is uh, blackness in brown spaces. Uh, a little bit uh, about uh, the subject is like uh, there is normalization of racism in Indian society, both as victims and perpetrators, that has led to violence against the other. We need to talk about the problem of race, just like we discuss issues of caste, class, and religious strife. We seek to bring under the lens blackness in brown spaces, uh, and this program is uh, live in YouTube now. Today, our moderator is Paranjay Guhathakurta. He's a uh, journalist, writer, and a documentary filmmaker. He's also a guest faculty member at IMA, IM Ahmedabad, Calcutta, and Shillong, and University of Delhi, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Asian College of Journalism, and Jamia Millia Islamia. And uh, I would like to say a little bit about the basic rules of this meeting is to participants to keep their mics mute. And we are requesting to keeping their videos off also, except for the panelists. For all comments and queries, please use the chat box. We'll pick up the queries from there. Uh, if there is any queries or comments, we'll pick it up from there. And now I request our moderator, uh, Puranjay sir, to introduce the panelists and start the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nilankur. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and all those who are listening in and viewing this program, uh, let me first say it's my honor and my privilege to be a moderator of this discussion. Uh, but before I introduce the panelists, I'd like to wish all of you a very happy new year. It's, uh, and, and we hope, we, we all hope that uh, after 2020, which has been a terrible, terrible year for the whole of the world, for the whole of humankind, and certainly for India, and I think for each and every one of us. So I, I, I wish all of you good wishes for 2020. And uh, let me first uh, introduce uh, a person uh, who's come joining us all the way from Lesotho, 
in Africa. It's in the southern part of Africa, not very far from South Africa. Uh, I have Erika Muzidzwa. Well, my pronunciation, I always get it a little wrong. Erika Muzidzwa. She, she uh, teaches psychology at the National University of Lesotho. And, and uh, she uh, has studied in India for six years. She did a master's, uh, she did a bachelor's degree from Ambedkar University in Delhi and, and subsequently a master's degree from Bengaluru. Uh, and and uh, she studied psychology in India. And what is very interesting is that she features in this documentary film called Unfair. And I'm one of the four directors of the film. And that's the reason why I'm moderating this panel, panel discussion. And this film uh, called Unhyphen Fair is a 52 minute documentary film. It's available on YouTube and all of you can view it. It was made and there are four, four of us uh, who were uh, jointly or uh, co-workers in the making of this, in the production and direction of this 52 minute documentary. It took us well over three years to make, almost four years. And, and the person who I want to give the maximum credit to is Wenceslaus Mendes, Wenci Mendes from Goa. He, he's the person who was really the moving force behind the film. He, he shot it, he uh, edited it, and, and, and uh, we were all part of the process of putting it all together, the production and the direction of this film. Besides Wenci Mendes, I have my colleague in NewsClick, uh, the portal NewsClick, Anushka and, 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 and Mohit, and, and, and I, I'm Paranjoy, and thank you so much once again for being with us. Uh, the, the other speaker who's uh, with us here today, and, and she's joining us all the way from uh, the Tamenglong, Tamenglong district of Manipur in the northeastern part of India. And, and uh, Tamenglong district is in, in Manipur, in the state of Manipur, which borders uh, Myanmar, and, and uh, it's on the other side of Nagaland and, 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 and Dr. Alana Gulmi is uh, a lawyer. She's a human rights activist and, and she, has, she is uh, one of the moving forces behind the Northeast Support Center and Helpline. And, and uh, she's right now about 140 kilometers from the capital of Manipur, which is um, Imphal. So, uh, Dr. Lane, uh, Alana will, uh, because of uh, a weak internet connection and perhaps an erratic in in internet connection, uh, will you you will just see her picture, her still picture, but you uh, would probably not be able to see her on the video. So, uh, we are hopeful. We are hopeful that the third speaker will also be joining us. She is Cynthia Stephen. Uh, she's an activist and she's with the TED's TDS Trust. So she hasn't joined us yet, but we are hopeful that she will join us soon. So let me start by asking Dr. Alana Gulmi to tell us a little bit about how in Indian society, we know it's a very complex, very heterogeneous society. We are the only country in the world with uh, 17 languages on our currency note, 21 languages in the eighth schedule of the constitution of India. And I know in Manipur, there is a dispute about whether the Manipuri script should be used or the Bengali script should be used, which is why, uh, you know, uh, there are more languages on the eighth schedule than in the uh, currency note because there are common scripts. But essentially we see uh, Indian society divides itself not only around region and religion, but we have the caste system, we have economic classes, and above all, there's the issue of skin color and your complexion that makes uh, a huge difference to certain sections of Indian society. So I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Alana Golme to speak uh, and, and give us uh, some idea of the discrimination that is faced by uh, individuals from the northeastern part of India, 
and in different parts of India, in North India and other parts of India, and also to speak specifically on the interconnection and the intersection of caste, class, and colorism or skin color in contemporary India. Over to you, Dr. Alana Gulme. Are you able to hear us, ma'am? Uh, Dr. Alana, are you able to hear us? Hello, hello, hello. Uh, I think she is unable to hear us. She hasn't responded. So let me pose the same question to Erika and ask her about her experiences in India and, and, and talk a little bit about what she saw in our, our country. Yes, please, Erika, over to you. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paranjoy. No I, doctor, no doctor, um, no PhD, no doctor. Paranjoy, no, that's good. No doctor. <laughs> okay, okay, so um, I've been in India for a period of six years and it has, uh, of, uh, um, it has been an experience, quite a great experience at some hand and quite horrific on the other hand, because of the skin that I, I possess, because of the tone of my skin and being a woman on the other hand. So it's, it's as if um, I'm underprivileged in terms of both being a woman and being a black woman. So, um, well, instances of uh, my experience, you know, they seem minor as uh, one uh, maybe probably walks into a bus and uh, the stare that you get, um, it comes with this uh, toxic stare as if you are not welcome in a particular place. And some are even shocked to see the face when they probably see you or even the text or the style that you're carrying. Um, at first it could be as ignorance, be lack of exposure, these people they're not really exposed to seeing Africans around them. They are not really uh, familiar with um, African people in general. So uh, maybe this is why they react in a particular way, especially um, in, when I started. That was in 20, 2011, I moved into India. And we were just about three Africans in the... Well... Uh, I, in the university environment was different because I was dealing with um, youngsters, probably my age mates. So uh, their take on me was not as hostile or um, unfriendly. But when I was outside, all new environment. But for some uh, later on, as the year went by, that was in 2012, a male joined the university because at first it was just two females. Now this male's um, experience was totally different because I realized the mob attacks in India are mostly targeted towards men as well. You'd find that people just get beaten up for no reason. And I used to ask myself, what are the, re what are the causes for such mob attacks in uh, India? towards African. Well, first, I, I thought it's because uh, they feel threatened, you know, the physique that the African man possesses, they are quite masculine or quite strong, you know. Uh, so I felt like, is it because they feel threatened by the, the skin tone, the physique is? Because our um, accents obviously are not the same. They seem to have a quite harsh tone when they speak. So it actually occurred to me as if it poses, uh, it poses some sort of threat to the Indian men and hence this is why they put African men. And then um, there, it was, there was an interesting um, news um, around 20, 2000, I think, or 15, when uh, 
there was a child who died somewhere around Peter, if I'm not and they, there was an African man who was Nigerian who ate the child. So they accused Africans of cannibalism. And this just says a lot about the society that you've been embedded in at that moment that are they really the kind that is there? Are they aware that we are not a primitive? We have actually developed the countries has developed. So maybe our um, media does not really say this out to the masses as such to show them that no, Africa is not the same as it was maybe um, 10, 100 years ago. Things have actually. So for me, it occurred as if it's ignorance. In some sense, or maybe they're just not aware things out there are not the same. So this issue of cannibalism really hit me hard because I even last heard of it centuries ago in Africa, like this is when it used to happen. And I couldn't believe that in the 21st century, people still believe that. Uh, so it's an interesting disheartening at that moment when it was happening because um, it actually increased the rise of attacks uh, towards Africans in, in India. I, I don't know if you have any questions or should I continue because I, I also thought Ms. Erika, Ms. Erika, please, please continue because we are still okay. waiting <laughs> we are still waiting for uh, our other speakers to get connected. So we, okay. I, I'd like you to uh, speak a little bit more about your experiences and then what we can do okay, is uh, sure. we'll take questions at the end of the, the conversation. All right. Okay. Okay. So I, at, at some sense, you know, I, in my head was, it's just minor things that seems quite trivial, but very important at the end of the day, because uh, when someone looks at my hair, probably I walk into a bus and someone just is um, keen to touch my hair. It's at first I would look at how the person um, is approaching. Some are friendly and really curious because they're really not aware. This is when I was so sure it's an aspect of ignorance. They really don't know. And when they see people on TV, they have straightened hair and they don't really know how the texture of our hair really looks like. So maybe this is why uh, people would approach me and say, can I please touch your hair? But I really feel offended because why would I allow you to just touch my hair and make fun of me because of the way I look? Um, and then you'd actually sometimes find people taking pictures of you and you're not even aware of it and you didn't even give them the consent to do that. But this would actually happen quite often, uh, even in the metro station, in buses, when you're just walking in the street, especially walking in the streets because the other person is probably in a, in a car or in a bus and then they just grab the opportunity to just take a video of you walking just because you are an African, which brings me to the next thing of um, objectification of people. So I would say, am I a museum? Do you think you just went to Red Fort and you just see me as that, uh, you know, object of pleasure for you because you're seeing something interesting, you just take pictures and take videos. So um, it's... To be a human being at some point, or in the view of other people, when Miserica, well, innocently, or Miserica, I'm interrupting yes. you because the internet connection was not particularly stable. So okay. you know, many of us did not hear the last few sentences of what you said. So if you don't mind, if you could kindly repeat yourself and then carry on. Okay, so I was 
in the last section, I was talking about an experience that I had in a lecture. And now one student, we were talking about genetics and um, it was a course on childhood development. Now, how do, ch how do children uh, develop and, you know, um, adjust to different environments as they grow up as kids. Now, uh, this one person walks up and says, um, Africans are genetically uh, designed to be immune to diseases. That was quite interesting because now I had to look at how, how much uh, we, we Africans would suffer from issues of nutrition, we suffer from uh, female feticide, we suffer from uh, a lot of actually <clears throat> other issues, even um, people dying of kwashioka, all these issues. But I just didn't understand why this particular person assumed that we are designed to be immune towards diseases, as if I am, or we are some machines that are really strong, cannot die, cannot feel pain. And this just said a lot about how other people might think, even dating it back to colonialism, where Africans were put in the fields because they felt like they are strong enough to do the manual and physical work. So it says a lot about human mind when they see black skin. Um, and it, it also says a lot about what they feel seeing a black woman now who um, is uh, seen as an object, maybe even a sexual object in some sense, because, uh, and you'll see that this doesn't happen only in the 21st century. It has been happening throughout the years, dating back um, even through colonialism itself uh, during the initial days of it. So, so um, all these experiences made me think a lot. I became participative in a lot of issues and, um, being active and trying to defend the African women, African people in India. Although I, I feel like I didn't do enough, but I did try my best to make people aware that Africans are the same as um, any other person. And black does not mean I'm not as pretty or as beautiful or as appreciative or appreciate, I cannot be appreciated like any other um, person. So um, although it is a growing uh, debate, because as you'd see that there is caste system in India. So it really made sense why as an African, I became the lowest in the strata, the very lowest, because I would become the darkest in terms of skin. So um, that means I really had to fight a lot to to, um, to be accepted in the system. Although I should also say they, it's not entirely um, as horrific as well because not everyone is the same. There are some people who would really be understanding and you'd see that, okay, you are getting an, another positive side of it. And at the same time, you'd see that there are manipulative people who know that, um, or an African, or maybe you don't really have much say, or you cannot really do anything. This is not even your country. They can even take advantage of that. I have cases of being followed through by some random strangers in a bus. You'd see that I took the bus maybe from New Delhi. By the time I reach Vasan Kunj, I see the same person dodging around, even if I tried to change buses to try and run away from the person, you see that I was being traced and being followed. Of course, rape issues are also high, but what does it mean towards an African who might experience the same? I've, I've had cases of this one girl who was molested in the bus and she was African. No one said anything. They just looked at the girl and didn't do or say anything. So manipulation comes into place now when they know that you are a foreigner and an African for that matter. If I was white, I don't think I would have experienced the same thing as I experienced in India. And interestingly, in the same university, there were exchange students from Hawaii who came to, to, to the university. 
and they get they got all the attention everyone wanted to talk to them and hear about their experiences and i just thought to myself that i really never got this kind of um, attention as an african i was actually sidelined i was disregarded laughed at um just by looking by a mere look people would just laugh start laughing and you would just not and you are you would understand but um the funny thing is for an african woman i would speak for myself i was so sure that i i have an upper hand because i am I, I am aware of the current situation around me, yet the people around me who are acting in this way were not really aware that um, what they are doing is wrong, laughing at me. But I'll just rub, rubbish it and say, you know what, this is how they perceive me. I cannot change their perspective. I can only change my perspective. Um, I've seen people leaving India within a year, some within months because they could not handle the, the racial discrimination that they faced. But I, I think I just told myself for the longest that I'm here for the reason and I'll be able to go through this and leave. People, there are some students who came to India India for studies and didn't make it back home in Africa because they were probably murdered by a gang of people who felt like uh, they have the right over their life. So I, I think I was one of the unfortunate ones who did not um, end up dying in India because of the color of my skin. I, I don't know if I should continue. Okay, um, let me make a few observations to what okay. you said, Ms. Erika. So uh, I'm going to make a few random observations about okay. uh, some of the points, some of the uh, uh, some of the comments that you've made, and uh, it seems that since there is uh, we are the only two speakers today because the other two individuals who are supposed to join us is not they are not present at this particular point of time. We can, uh, I, I, I can hold, uh, I, I can say much more than what I was originally intending to do. Suppose. Uh, okay. The film Unfair, the link to which has been provided uh, on the chat box by Nilankur, uh, we do feature a specific case of a young African student who was brutally murdered and uh, he was from Burundi. And uh, we speak to people who knew him. Uh, and, and since uh, we, we spoke to the various uh, police authorities and the local people in the, who, were so, um, who were aware of what had happened, this happened in the Northern Indian state of Punjab in, in a place called Ludhiana a lovely professional university. Uh, this was a horrific example. And as uh, Erika also pointed out, yes, there are very, very, uh, there are terrible human beings in this country who discriminate uh, against people on the basis of their skin color and they objectify them and look on them as, ob as objects. But she also mentioned others who were not. And, and what we saw uh, in the case of uh, this young student who died, uh, he was from Burundi, there were a lot of people who helped out. And, and we also found that the people who were accused of killing him uh, and, one of, uh, uh, and, and, and they were well connected, they ran away. They literally left the country because they were scared of being arrested. And eventually, uh, though he passed away, we uh, do, did we, we spoke to his father. We spoke to his father, and and we got his views. Uh, there were people who actually did help them, but as Erika has rightly pointed out, very large section of people, they are not only discriminating against uh, people with dark skin, but also women in general. I mean, she's been very clear. I mean, I mean, they, I mean we have the case of the gang rape of Nirbhaya in Delhi. So um, the discrimination is certainly at very, very, at multiple levels. And as she has rightly pointed out, uh, male, males tend to face a different kind of discrimination from 
women. And, and uh, I, I should say, sometimes uh, greater aggression we see. The second point that she pointed out was about, you know, the misconceptions that many ignorant people in our country have about the persons from Africa being cannibals. I mean, I, I mean uh, today we don't have uh, Dr. Alana Golme with us, but they have similar sort of misconceptions and completely wrong notions about even people from the Northeast. And they're all supposed to be cannibals. They eat human beings. All of which is absolutely false, untrue. I think uh, as the opening uh, slide show that was put together by Das, THUS and Nilankur's team uh, showed, historically, our two countries, uh, I don't mean Lesotho, but the countries of Africa and people from the Indian subcontinent had very, very long historical links. And these were not just links of uh, a trade. These were links where people from the two parts of the world would come and, and, and some of them occupied important positions of power in, in also in, in these organizations. Uh, but what is very, very interesting is that we in India, we tend to conflate everybody from Africa. I mean, how, how many Indians know how many countries there are in Africa? There are 54 countries in the continent of Africa. And, and these countries are very different from one another. If you go to Egypt, if you go to Algeria, if you go to Tunisia, those countries are very, very different from the countries of Central Africa or, or, or the countries of West Africa or East Africa. If you look at Mauritius, which is a, a, an island state, that is also a part of Africa. But two thirds of the people of Mauritius are persons of Indian origin. We have large numbers uh, uh, of, of persons from, uh, of, uh, from Indian origin who are based in, in many, many African countries, uh, not just uh, South Africa, but in Kenya and Nigeria, among other places. But uh, uh, the ignorant in this country, and there are no dearth of such ignorant and intolerant uh, people in this country, they, talk, they, they, despite this long history, they tend to conflate all the 54 countries of Africa into one country. I mean, they forget, and, and what, what uh, Erika was just mentioning, her look, the way her hair looks. I mean, people in India don't realize that there are persons of, from India who live in Gujarat, who live in different parts of India, who look exactly like the way Erika's brothers and sisters and family and friends look. And, 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 and there are people from the uh, Andaman and Nicobar Islands, the Jarawa tribes, who are quote unquote, Negroid. I mean, I mean, these are very, very colonial terms, colonial expressions, where your color of your skin and whether your the hair is curly or not. And as she was saying, you know, uh, those who have curly hair, they want straight hair. And those who want straight, have straight hair want curly hair. I, I, I always had curly hair. I wanted straight hair. My daughter, she has wonderful curly hair, but she wants straight hair. She's got it straightened out. Anyway, uh, I'm not commenting about individual preferences of hairstyles. But as she said, if somebody wants to touch her hair, some of them could be out of just sheer curiosity, plain, simple curiosity, with, with no ill intention or adverse intention. But there are others, as she pointed out a little while back, who look on her as an object. I mean, we have to remember something that one of the world's biggest multinational corporations, the, uh, based in the United Kingdom and in Netherlands, which is Unilever, its Indian affiliate, Hindustan Lever, one of its top selling products, one of its highly profitable products is a product called Fair and Lovely Cream. I mean, they have one for women, they have one for men, and, and now there are all kinds of similar products. I mean, this whole business of quote unquote, fairness creams is, is, is quite a big business in this country. 
Uh, and and I, I, I regret to say that this big multinational, they, they justify, they justify that this is quote unquote aspirational. What can you do if people want their, their skin to look fairer than it is? What can we do if this product is exported from India to different parts of the world and including countries in Africa? You know, we have a gentleman who we interview who represents the advertising business uh, who talks about this. So uh, the point is what we are seeing is also uh, how deeply uh, divided and discriminatory India is. And as uh, Erika was talking about a little while ago, she seems to be the lowest in the caste hierarchy when she was in India. She suddenly felt that way on more than one occasion. The toxic glances that he got, the toxic looks that she got, the stares that she got, and how people try to stalk her on public transport. And, and, uh, and this whole issue of genetics and genetic, genetic design, you know, uh, we, we, we in this film, and I'd urge all of you to, to uh, join, uh, um, uh, to, to have a look at the film because we talk about sportspersons of African origin. We talk about Indians who look quote unquote like Africans who are uh, good at, at sports. We talk about persons of Indian origin who act uh, in, in as, as quote unquote Africans in, in uh, films, in Bollywood films. So, so you, you will get to know a little bit about that. And before I join, I think we have with us uh, Cynthia Stephen and, and she's uh, uh, an activist and, and she's with the TED's Trust if I'm not mistaken. Uh, she's an activist and a, an analyst. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna get to her in a very short while from now. Before that, I want to talk about, uh, I want to end my little observation of what Erica said about the color of a person's skin. And, and you know, uh, this is the famous Ethiopian emperor, Haile Selassie, who made this famous statement that, you know, until the color, you know, I mean, that we have to wait for the day until the color of a person's skin, a man's skin, is of no more significance than the color of his eyes. Yes, you prick our, our, our skin, Erica's, the blood of Erica's in body and my body and your body will all be the same color. And artists use the same color of vermilion or brown to, to, paint, us, uh, to paint us. So uh, may I now move on to Cynthia Stephen, Cynthia, if you can yes. hear us, we'd, yes. we'd like your observations, uh, your uh, comments and your views on the interconnectedness of skin color, race and caste and class in contemporary India. Over to you, Ms. Cynthia Stephen. Thank you so much. I, uh, first of all, at the outset, I apologize for uh, uh, for not uh, showing up at uh, you know at the fixed time, I had to somebody and sort of uh, uh, was working with them and uh, you know just uh, it was Vincy's call that just called uh, alerted me to the fact that I was expected elsewhere. Uh, so apologies. Uh, and, but and I'm Cynthia, really Cynthia, here. Cynthia, 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 G. Before you start, G. briefly introduce yourself because I couldn't get an opportunity to ask you how you would like me to introduce you. So it would be a good idea if you just told us a little bit about yourself and, and then go ahead, please. The, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm uh, 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 a gender and development uh, uh, policy analyst. Uh, and an independent journalist based in Bangalore, and also work on uh, women's and children's rights, and of course strongly on, on Dalit women's and children's rights. That's my specific areas: uh, gender development, uh, Dalit issues, and uh, you know, I do a lot of writing, training, and speaking on that. And I also run the Training Editorial and Development Services Trust, which works on all these areas. So that's briefly in a nutshell what I do. I'm also a political activist. A human rights activist, uh, and so yeah, this is this is where I come from. Uh, the thing is, uh, it's interesting that you you just uh, brought in this matter of because here we're talking about color, basically black, uh, you know, blackness and brownness. But uh, while you while listening to you, I had a flashback, Varunjaji, uh, and I was thinking of a, a young uh, 
girl that I was may have been in third or fourth standard. The first time in public, I was uh, called a black monkey. Uh, that person who I, uh, a friend, a young friend of mine did that. And I used to get key, that she was the only one who teased that. I was never ever teased like that by anyone else, uh, except like that. So that's when I began to realize that there was something about color, uh, you know, that uh, made people judge. Uh, and it's a pejorative uh, term. And we are judged as uh, on the basis of our skin color at that young age. And she was also my young children are very um, uh, insensitive sometimes to their, uh, uh, to their peers. And uh, so, uh, so that was my first consciousness. It was very much later, many, many, many years later, decades later, that I became also conscious of uh, Dalitness. Blackness and Dalitness overlapping in my life in a special way. And uh, so, for instance, I had another friend, a friend's wife actually, she used to say, I always used to get selected as a, a tool in, in school for uh, representing Krishna because she was black, because of my dark complexion. That's what she was. She was a very pretty, pretty little girl, who young lady, who was actually a, <laughs> an air hostess. And uh, so it was... It was things like these that made me uh, understand myself uh, in a in a way that uh, I began to appreciate the beauty in a dark complexion. And I would say uh, that uh, yeah, uh, I would. Sorry, I'm told that my audio is not very good. I'm just getting uh, earphones. Uh, I would say that um, that has been a part of me that, you know, I appreciate uh, the beauty of a dark complexion, which is unusual. Because I remember when my daughter was a very small child, she has a dark complexion like me, and this appeals to me very strongly. And she used to say, Mommy, I want to be fair. Even at a very young age, with almost nobody um, uh, uh, there to tell her anything about her color. Nobody used to talk about her color to her. But she, mommy, I want to be fair. What is it in our culture that makes a person value themselves based on the color of their skin? And I believe that in my, uh, as I said, I'm also social, I look into social analysis. I'm a critic of, uh, you know, society, so social um, uh, order, if you like, the Indian social order. And one of the things that's very, very clear about us is that uh, we value people based on their gender, on their color, on their caste. And I think that, that is an important uh, you know, distinction to be. So in my case, uh, I'm, uh, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, concentric circles where you know, we operate. From being inside a uh, uh, in the center of your world, you become conscious of your color, your gender, and then your caste. That's what happened to me. And so I think that that is an important progression. And my own understanding and critique of our, our Indian social order comes from there. And uh, and also the fact that I belong to a religious minority, it's impossible to escape that because my name is Cynthia. So it's assumed that I am a Christian and I am. Uh, and I'm a practicing and believing Christian, which I'm quite open about. And I believe that uh, it is important. And you know, there's a verse in the Bible which says, I am black but beautiful. And I have always, uh, you know, found that very encouraging. And uh, also, in, our, in, in even in the Indian culture, uh, the God Krishna has considered to be a very, you know, a very popular and lovable, uh, uh, you know, incarnation. Uh, it also, uh, his name Krishna itself means dark. So it is not as, and then the goddess Kali is also uh, black. So it's not as if uh, color is totally uh, 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 sort of given a negative uh, feeling in the culture. But definitely, I think that uh, the way in which our uh, society is shaped in recent days, particularly after. Uh, liberalization, economic liberalization, this has become a very important aspect. And I would like to connect this um, when we talk about uh, 
gender and class, I'd like to talk about certain things. Another experience which I just came to my mind. Uh, I was uh, a friend and I, uh, both women activists, were uh, in Delhi for some work for, for, for me attending a conference. Uh, my friend is a very tall and very good-looking lady and was very well-dressed. I was wearing a simple shirt, salwar kutta, but we were basically doing the same things. She's a lawyer and an activist and uh, keeps it up. And we went to have the, the office we went to attend was closed. They were closed for lunch. So we went to have lunch in, the, in a very crowded little restaurant uh, uh, in, in Delhi. And so there was one uh, seat, one table which was just beginning to get vacant. So I was standing there and waiting. My friend went to wash her hands. The, they, the ladies were about to leave. Um, they tell me, uh, they exactly told me this. Uh, madam, she is a hair by such thing. Like they tell me, they, they assume that I was uh, a domestic uh, with this lady, with my friend. This is the assumption about color class, uh, you know, and obviously class. That uh, that is the popular notion. Uh, like I, I just didn't react at that point. I just uh, the point which she's making is that this is your. Uh, you wait for it. She thought I was standing and waiting because the lady has to come and sit down. She said, You can sit down because the lady will sit down. Uh, Cynthia, <coughs> Cynthia, we are not able to hear you very clearly. I'm sorry, I think it's the next minute. Okay, just a minute. Cynthia, Hi. two points. Two points. Uh, we are not able to hear you very clearly, and it would help us if, because of the uh, somewhat erratic and unstable internet connectivity, if you could speak a little slower. <laughs> and we are happy to, and we are happy to inform you that Dr. Alana Golme is back, uh, and and uh, as soon as Miss Cynthia Stephen has completed her uh, her observations and remarks, I'm going to move to you. Dr. Alana, please stay with us. Please continue. Ms. Cynthia Stephen, please continue. Okay, great. Has this, is this a little better? Much better. Much, oh, much better. better. You should have done this a little okay. earlier. It's much, much better. Okay. No, no. I, I wasn't aware that it was... Uh, you know, I think the battery was running a little low. I wasn't... I know. Uh, uh, you hadn't I noticed the comments that had been coming yeah. on the chat box. Oh, no, I didn't. Yeah. I see. Please okay. continue, ma'am. Yeah, so it's not, for, for some reason, the chat box is not, uh, is, not, uh, uh, is not visible for some funny reason. One second. Doesn't matter. Uh, okay. Doesn't matter. Please yeah. continue. So, so, the, the, so in other words, uh, it's a very personal thing. So it's not about abstract uh, understanding of color, of race, or caste, or whatever. These are all banal daily incidents lived in uh, you know realities that are that we go through uh, and in fact this, the consciousness of color came very much at a childhood age whereas the consciousness of caste in my life came at a much much older at a much more uh, mature stage in my life but it really made me understand a lot about um, how our society is fragmented along these identi identity uh, related lines and also, I know a number of very, very fine young ladies, for instance, uh, who are very intellig uh, intelligent, talented, very good looking, and actually would make excellent, you know, uh, um, partners, life partners. But the only reason that they have not married is because of their color. This is, a, this is the way uh, our society operates. It's highly, it's almost as if, if, you're, if you don't fit the template, then you're out. You are othered in every sense of the word. So this is an important, uh, you know, observation about uh, Indian uh, realities, and it is also again linked to color. And I was just building up uh, to the point of when this whole thing became even more acute is when color-related, you know, fairness screens came on the market. When did the fairness screens come into the market? I remember distinctly a, a particular stage because I was a very young lady at that time in my twenties. And I was a person who grew up in a small town and not very interested in, you know, applying chemicals on my face. 
me. I believed in natural products. So my uh, cosmetics were shisakai for my hair, you know, and uh, milk and cream and basin for my face and stuff like that. But it was also that and too, Miss Fox began to choose Indian uh, girls as beauty queens. When Indian girls began to win the beauty pageant, that is where the market, that is just after economic liberalization, then 80s and the late 80s and early 90s. And I clearly see the link between the billions of uh, rupees of, uh, uh, you know, advertising and focus on cosmetics uh, and looks for girls. Whereas in this 80s, uh, you know, the lip color and uh, eye makeup were very popular, but fairness creams are not a very serious. Uh, in fact, if I remember right, dark skinned uh, models were quite, uh, were not unpopular. I remember seeing quite dark skinned models, uh, you know, modeling for Lakme and all that lip, lip color, because they said dark skin models look good with dark, uh, uh, you know, uh, lip color and eye eye makeup and eyeshadow and all that. So there was a very popular uh, uh, market for uh, uh, face makeup, which suited dark skin, you know, women. There was no focus at all when I was growing up on being fair. It was only after the economic liberalization and the beauty pageant began to, I would, I would say that this is probably uh, deliberately chosen uh, things that suddenly Indian girls start becoming. So we had Miss Universe and Miss uh, World, uh, you know, a series of uh, young ladies, Diana Hayden, uh, Aishwarya. Rita Faria, Rita Faria. Rita Faria was very long ago. That was very much earlier before liberalization. That's the point I'm trying to make. That is exactly the point I'm trying. Rita Faria belonged to a different generation and she won on merit and Color was not a big factor in the beauty industry in India at that point. Got you. Got you, madam. Yeah, that's the point I was uh, trying to make. I have a request if you can complete your, your, your initial remarks and then we'll go on to Dr. Alana. I'll do that. Uh, just give me two minutes. I'll wind up uh, my, my initial remarks. Of course, I'm available for the rest of the discussion. <laughs> so, the, so as I said, the color, the, the beauty industry uh, blew up uh, hugely after the economic liberalization and the beauty pageants uh, began and they actually uh, the indian women uh, women's movement had a huge protest against a beauty pageant that was set up in bangalore they said it's uh, it's uh, you know objectifying women there was a lot of uh, opposition by the indian women's movement in bangalore at that point and uh, so there was a, there was a lot, lot of uh, hoo ha about it but now everyone seems to have sort of taken it to their stride and you know understood that uh, fair is beautiful and that's why we have fair and lovely, fair and handsome and so on. So the, uh, this is on the one hand. On the other hand, when you look at caste, uh, the depiction of, uh, uh, you know, villains, for instance, or uh, uh, working class people are always in darker colors in any uh, artistic uh, endeavor, whether it's films, whether it's art or, you know, whatever, painting, whatever. So this is another point I want to underscore. But it's not as if all Dalits in India are dark skinned. There are lots of Dalits who are very good looking, considered classically good looking and fair. There was a very, very interesting film made by a, a, a young, uh, you know, Dalit filmmaker, uh, precisely on this uh, on this point, where there is a uh, an effort by a team to find a Dalit looking person. And when they when they see a fair young woman and saying, yes, you want to, uh, you know, what do you want to talk to me about? They say, you're not looking Dalit enough. And finally, they put a fellow in, in blackface uh, to to play the role. So it's a, it's a mockery actually in our uh, in our culture that we uh, that we still uh, glorify a fair skin and, um, uh, you know, uh, attribute a kind of, uh, it, it, blackness is given a pejorative, uh, uh, you know, yeah. Uh, meaning in our in our culture which is which shows a deep sense of uh, uh, it's a kind of a social pathology i would say and really needs uh, a lot of work whereas fair skinned dalits are also said how come you're a dalit you don't look like a dalit because you're fair but there are certain dalit subcasts who tend to be uh, of a very fair uh, complexion 
So this is the irony and the paradox of color, race, and caste uh, in India. Uh, with these remarks, I'll, I'll uh, uh, hand the uh, session back to you. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Cynthia Stephen. You've touched on a number of very, very important issues. I don't really want to elaborate on them because you've been very articulate in talking about it. I mean, essentially, the attempt to conflate a uh, uh, position in the caste hierarchy with skin color. How should a Dalit look? You know, and, and here I'm going to bring in uh, Dr. Alana uh, Golme. You know, this are again a notion of who is tribal? What is a tribal? Who is she or he? An Aboriginal or, or, or you know, uh, or, or uh, an Adivasi? A tribal from Jharkhand or a tri tribal from Chhattisgarh or Madhya Pradesh or Orissa or Bengal and a tribal from Manipur or Nagaland or Arunachal or Meghale, etc, 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 or Tripura or Assam or Arunachal or Sikkim, etc. So our uh, notions and uh, our notions uh, and, and, and uh, as you rightly pointed out, the pathology of, you know, our, our social, uh, the way we have developed certain stereotypes in our mind and, and our stereotypical notions about that. It seems we've again lost Dr. Alana. Should have brought her in a little earlier, but I, well, 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 Dr. Alana, are you back with us? Are you back with us? No, she's not. Because uh, I, I, again, I wanted to ask her certain questions about it, but what I'll do is uh, while we're waiting for Dr. Alana to join us, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, could we uh, maybe ask somebody to take, uh, if anybody here uh, is interested in raising a question, uh, we'll be happy to join, uh, to happy if uh, either Ms. Erica or Ms. Cynthia could take those questions. Uh, if you have any questions, we'd be very happy because I, I don't think uh, at this particular point of time, we, just, we had got, uh, Miss Dr. Alana Gulmi from Manipur, but we see that she has not been able to continue. I mean, she's in a uh, an area where her internet connectivity has not been good, and that's the way it is. So, is there any are there any questions that have come up? Uh, uh, is there anybody here in this group? Uh, there are uh, about sixteen of us right now here. Uh, is, is anybody here would like to raise a question? Uh, would uh, I see some names over here? Uh, Reggie, uh, Dusu Yabo, Virginia Saldhana, Amrita Sunita Anand, Elsa Mutathu, uh, Fabrice Bourgel Pyrus, excuse my pronunciation, I, got, I may have got it completely wrong. May I wish Astrid Loba Gajiwala, Shrayagri, uh, sorry, Shreyagi, Shreyagi. Again, my apologies for mispronouncing your name. Uh, if you have any questions, please go ahead and ask Cynthia or, or, or ask Erica. And, and I'm sure um, Nilankur will unmute you as soon as you say you want to raise, just raise your hand. And that's it. Nilankur, do we have any questions for any of our speakers? Sorry, can't hear you. Yeah, so I would I would like to ask about these uh, uh, black rulers of South India. Like there are a lot of black people who have raised in the uh, ranks of army and were ruling some places. And there's this Siddhi community. Uh, the issues of them you have picked up in the film uh, hashtag unfair. And would you like to tell something about that, uh, Poranjira? You know, uh, in the film we show how, and I, as your own video earlier showed, you know, the links between the continent of Africa and the Indian subcontinent go back, you know, very, very long back, uh, literally centuries. And as, as I mentioned a little while earlier, these were not just trade links. These were very, very close associations. I mean, we had, rulers in, in geographical territory, which we now call India, were people of African origin and vice versa. 
there were people from different parts of India, including the southern part of India, who were actually quote unquote nobles and rulers in the countries of Africa. And as, as I had pointed out a little while earlier, it's not just the uh, tribal, the Jawar, uh, Jarawas of, uh, of the Nicobar Islands, I mean, the, the Siddhi community, I mean, and we talk a lot about the Siddhi community in this film and in the film on YouTube. So maybe uh, see if there are no other questions, you know, uh, again, we go back to the point that Cynthia flagged and Erica also talked about, and maybe I'll ask both of them, Erica first and then Cynthia, to talk about this notion of who's beautiful. Uh, Cynthia talked about these beauty contests and linking that with the, the changes that have happened since the 90s with economic liberalization and, and the, the whole idea of so-and-so is beautiful, fair and lovely, fair and ugly, fair and handsome, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, these, these notions, how deeply ingrained they are in the psyches of, of different people. Uh, notably Indians, and, and how is it linked to the way we uh, have these social hierarchies, which, which sometimes overlap, but on occasions don't overlap. Caste and class often overlap in India. Typically, uh, the upper castes are, are relatively better off economically, and those belonging to the lower castes are economically uh, much worse off. But there are, there are of course, exceptions. There are poor Brahmins and rich Dalits, but, but the point is the social discrimination the, the, the uh, economic uh, uh, discrimination. Maybe, uh, Erika, you'd like to talk about that. In, is really the, uh, the, uh, the, the caste system unique to India? Or do we see different manifestations of the caste system in other parts of the world? That could be a question. And this whole notion of the concept of beauty, who is beautiful, who is not, and, and the big business uh, around the, the so-called beauty business. Yes, Erica, over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's really interesting that you brought this up because as we were talking, um, the first thing that came to my mind was that Africa is also fighting the same kind of war of fairness and, and fair skin. You'd see that uh, beauty crims are starting to take a very high note in Africa where even we don't appreciate our own blackness now. We want to be fairer, we start bleaching our skin because we want to be a part of the whole, the part of the beauty. Because as it is, in as much as we are in Africa and we are the dark continent, according to what uh, some writers would say, we don't appreciate the darkness anymore. We don't appreciate the blackness anymore. Um, I actually embraced what Conrad wrote in his book when he said the dark continent, because to me, darkness was beauty. But now the darkness is no longer appreciated. We have this term in Africa called yellow bone for some reason. Yellow bone is for the light skinned or light toned women or men. So that is the most appreciated skin and that means beauty. So if you're dark skin, even in Africa itself, you are not as beautiful. And I, I was particularly interested or very um, happy <laughs> when uh, the Miss Universe happened and Miss South Africa is the one who won the award, who was um, typically black, short hair, African kinky hair. And this said a lot about how uh, the current generation is trying to break the way beauty has been viewed over the years, where only <laughs> The, the light skinned um, people were the one who won the awards. So here they broke the channel. They just sent a different message. And this is what we need in the society. We need to relearn that black is not ugly. So I was really happy about this because it tried to also teach the whole world that you know what? Black is just as beautiful as what you see um, amongst any other white people. And you, you said something about this, um, you know, the inter the interchange between caste, class, and how um, here as a black person you're viewed as poor. No one would actually see black as beautiful or as if you have got money. So people would just see you as black, and then you're socially you're put 
down in the social strata, economically down. And I would ask myself, why is that only one country in Africa seems to be getting on top of the level, which is South Africa? And also you'd see that there are so many different cultures that are there, especially the white men, and they are the ones ruling the country. So in as much as all the continents are advancing in terms of e their the economy, Africa is still lagging back. All the trash that the world doesn't want is thrown here. We have issues of uh, countries throwing things like bales. There's these things called bale, uh, where even UK, US, China, they have used clothes that they feel they don't want anymore. They are thrown back here to Africa. And we buy these things because we have been put in such a place where we, we, we need, we are, we are at the mercy of them. And we cannot really afford to buy new things because we just end up taking all the trash that the other people do not seem to need. Of course, you may view, it can be viewed in different ways. It can be viewed as one uh, country which is trying to help us, but it is also sending another message. We even had cases that um, these bales, uh, people, they've been from hospitals of people suffering from COVID-19 sent down to Africa for us to buy this secondhand stuff. So these are the things that we are constantly suffering from. And then you ask yourself, why is this constantly happening? Okay. So, so I don't know if, if you want me to comment further, but yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this, one, this is what I have so far. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Erika. Uh, and and uh, maybe I'll ask now Cynthia, uh, because we still haven't been able to get Dr. Alana uh, back into our conversation. So I'm going to ask Ms. Cynthia Stephen to, in a sense, wrap up this conversation and make a few comments, because what Erika said, a couple of very, very interesting observations she referred to. Uh, Joseph Conrad's very, very famous novella, Heart of Darkness, you know, about the white man uh, getting into to colonize, the beginning of colonization, the appropriation of the, the natural resources, the wealth of Africa. And finally, Mr. Kurtz, he becomes, he, he decides he's not going to come back from the heart of darkness. That same line, which was used by Thomas Turn Eliot's T.S. Eliot, in his uh, famous poem called The Wasteland, Mr. Kurtz, he's dead. So, so it's amazing that uh, I, I find it uh, so, so perceptive on Erica's part to make this reference and how today's Africa is actually importing whiteness creams or fairness creams from Hindustan Lever, the fair and lovely cream from India. And, and you know, these, these colors, to what extent, uh, and, and here, Cynthia, I'd, I'd really like to, uh, you to add, some of the, to some of the observations made by Erica, she's talked about how South Africa, the wealthiest, the, the wealthiest part of the entire continent, the southern tip, which where, where, where a, a lot of the natural resources and a lot of the wealth was concentrated. And, and it's also that part of India, which had institutionalized skin color in the working of the government, the working of the state, the, the apartheid system, which, which was there for many, many, many years before uh, uh, it was overthrown and, and they were thrown out. But uh, the point is these colors, to what extent are these colonial constructs yellow? The people from the People's Republic of China, yellow. The people of Asia and India are brown. The dark continent has dark people and the West is white. This, this, this division of the globe on the basis of skin color. Maybe you can add a little bit to our conversation and then uh, we, we'll be able to close our conversation. Yes, please. Please, Cynthia, over to you. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. You have to unmute yourself. Have I done that? Yes. yes, now you have. Now you can go on. We couldn't hear what you said. I was just saying that I'm remembering a book by William Dalrymple. In fact, two books. One called The White Muggles and the other one called uh, 
the white the the last mughal uh, the white mughal refers to an earlier part of uh, you know, the the indian uh, you know uh, history subcontinental history where people from the colonial from the uh, from the west came and uh, completely uh, assimilated into the life of the country here married indian women had in women here and then in the last mughal he refers to how uh, this underwent a shift after the uh, the crown took over the uh, administration after 1857 and how in earlier when books were written there were references to the uh, indian families of these men which were edited out in subsequent editions so there is a historical connect between and a political connect between <clears throat> color and uh, power and race and identity so i was just wanting to bring that as well so i think it's important i think people will also realize people who are in literature for instance uh, uh, during shakespeare's time the color issue was not very uh, very strongly because colonialism hadn't spread so so very much so we have othello which has a a black hero and uh, you know and uh, he, he's a black hero but in subsequent uh, english literatures uh, we see that uh, you know blackness is seen uh, with a with a more colonial in a colonial uh, construct as uh, inferior as servile you know and uh, the the dignity that the black people are shown in in works in earlier uh, english uh, literatures uh, are is not seen much later so i think um, it's uh, it, the political uh, processes are also important and uh, i was just uh, uh, while uh, listening to uh, erica i was talking about she's talking about south africa how is it that it's coming up i think south africa has had a very strong history of struggle against apartheid and also mobilization of the black people for uh, uh, for leadership and uh, sharing of power i think that is also an important aspect of how uh, uh, you know this works if you look at say for instance the american civil rights movement uh, the, it was the black women who gave a lot of leadership uh, and ideological strength to the struggle as well and if you remember the black is beautiful was a very very strong phrase which came out that's and, good uh, yeah and also the struggle uh, had this other aspect of uh, popularizing the afro haircut where the 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 hair and the hair style which is natural of africa uh, of yeah, african american uh, was uh, highlighted and made a fashion statement Uh, if now, i can yeah. if i can briefly intervene here cynthia please, please. you know you were talking about the uh, the uh, the what has happened in the united states of america in the film by the way we have a a, a brief uh, clip when angela davis had come to to mumbai and she spoke and and today uh, exactly. we are we have already seen after the the death uh, of george floyd how the black lives matter movement in the united states of america uh we we've seen the how it has happened and for your information uh there have been two comments uh, on the chat box one uh, uh, both of them addressed to you one by reggie uh, he said hi cynthia you have rightly pointed out that the change happened with liberalization clearly india seems to have embraced the inbuilt racism in american individualism and combined it with the caste system do you see any counter movements to this in india maybe educating and informing people away from this dangerous trend this is a question raised by reggie in the in the chat box and also virginia saldana has raised an important point uh, i mean that she's uh, expressed her happiness he said i'm glad that cynthia finally brought out the complexities and intersections of caste color politics and e- economics so uh, i would be happy to have your closing remarks and i i see sanjoy hazarika here and if sanjoy is listening to me and if he's not averse to speaking a few words i'd like him to sort of chip in a little bit in the absence of we were supposed to have dr alana golme from manipur to talk about the discrimination that people from the northeastern part of india have faced 
And since you, Sanjay, you've been very, very, you are not only, uh, uh, I can see, yes, within diverse nations of many colors, there is an extensive discrimination against minority ethnicities. That's what Sanjay has written. And, and uh, that's an important point he's raised. I can see Sanjay has put on his thing. We'll have him uh, uh, speak a few words. Uh, but before that, Cynthia, your closing remarks, and maybe you can uh, respond to what Reggie said. Yes. Uh, uh, thank you so much. And then there's Astrid also, my good friend Astrid, who's raised the question of dark gods. Uh, dark uh, gods, you, you, you've talked about Krishna, yes. Krishna dark gods and Kali. Hinduism, yes. How do you reconcile yes. it? Yes. I think so. I think, uh, I think these are all important connectivities. Uh, remember that uh, Krishna belongs not to an elite uh, community, but to a working class community, a pastoral community called the Yadavs, basically cowherds who are not, uh, who are the working class, who don't uh, belong to any of the uh, touchable castes, actually. They belong to the Shudra community. The Kali is also a goddess uh, who is... Uh, who is not a Brahmanical goddess, but a pre-Brahmanical goddess. Uh, peoples, uh, you know, uh, belongs to the uh, indigenous uh, belief system and who has actually been, if you like, co-opted into a Brahmanical uh, mainstream belief system. So uh, you connect that with the, the kind of power uh, associated with the majoritarian religious and belief system, and you come up with these inequalities. So you and then don't forget about the gender aspect. I was just going to also talk about something that struck me very forcibly when some years ago, a few years ago, maybe two or three years ago, there was a, a, a conference for Dalit women, a Dalit women's conference in Pune at the Savitri Bhai Phule University. And one of, there were a lot of parallel conferences, but one of the very most popular conferences you know, uh, sessions that was there, uh, I saw, you know, the room filled to overflowing. Uh, it was about romantic relationships. And uh, Dalit women, young women uh, who are in university or in college, uh, who are participating, were all, you know, sharing about their, uh, how their, uh, their personal relationships was, uh, was very much affected by uh, the, uh, the issue of culture. And caste. So even the Dalit boys seem to prefer the uh, girls from, uh, you know, the non uh, the untouchable caste uh, on the one hand, whereas they were befriended by uh, boys, but later on when it came to marriage, they were being rejected. So uh, everyone was going through this turmoil of why they were being rejected, what was the, uh, what was the thing that was happening to them. And so just, it's a matter of great concern for uh, young women. Uh, you know, their, their uh, romantic relationships, their personal lives and uh, marital life, if you like, uh, also having uh, huge implications. I think this is, uh, uh, these are concerns that uh, have much, much deeper connotations. And we also, for instance, had a series of um, advertisements, which were also, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the con due to the furor, then the company had to take them off. But you had this young girl who was very accomplished, but because she had a dark complexion, she was not able to get in uh, in as a, an air hostess. And then she uh, goes, uses this cream for a few weeks, a few days, and uh, she has a fairness, uh, uh, you know, counter. She checks her color against them, and then she gets into the, uh, she becomes an air them what they need. And I actually have a French daughter who was very beautiful with very lovely thick curly hair and uh, very, but very dark. And she actually got rejected as an air hostess and they tried to uh, make her, you know, apply fairness cream. She underwent an allergy problem. And for weeks and months, she had to take treatment to clear her, um, her face. And this, uh, this is a damage caused by the kind of advertising and the kind of pressure put on young girls. And I think all of us need to think carefully about 
the values that we are uh, inculcating in our young people, where beauty becomes the surface beauty becomes more important and the real person inside is obscured by the color of their complexion. I would like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you so much, India Stephen, for your very, very perceptive and incisive remarks. And your friend Astrid Lobo Gajwala has said that in India, racist remarks in the uh, a workplace could be should be uh, sort of included on the under the posh act or the prevention of sexual harassment act and and reported to internal communi communities and and need to support such action and and that's one of the suggestions that she has made and and uh, reggie also thinks that there should be counter movements and and besides educating and informing people uh, uh, they have to try and see if we can build up counter arguments so uh, sanjoy thank you very much uh, for being part of this conversation. And uh, we didn't have uh, Dr. Alana Golme because of poor connectivity in Manipur. Uh, but please, please give us your observations about how, uh, and we'll have, to, we'll have to be closing our discussion soon. Uh, you know, you yourself have talked about the diversity of this country. It's, it's the many colors, the, the extensive, deep discrimination against different minorities against different people from different ethnic groups. So specifically, if you can tell a little bit about, you know, this thing about the Northeasterners being like closer to China than to the cow belt of North India. And then the kind of discrimination that uh, a lot of people from the Northeastern part of India face in um, different parts of the country. Yes, please. Sanjoy, over to you. And I, 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 I did uh, not... Uh, just a brief introduction of Mr. Sanjay Hazarika. He, he's a reputed journalist. He's worked with various organizations, including the New York Times. And he's currently heading the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative based out of Delhi. Yes, please, Sanjay, over to you. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Pranjoy. Uh, I apologize for coming in so late. I was in another discussion on the Northeast, which was very interesting, which was with the former Home Secretary and a few others, on uh, how numbers don't tell stories. They, you know, statistics don't add up because often the people are missing from the statistics. Uh, but uh, something that Cynthia Stephen said about the Yadavs and Krishna, the Yadavs are a very powerful political community in India right now. I mean, you've had chief ministers uh, on and off uh, Yadavs in, in the largest state. So, uh, you know, it's not just a question of, of history and mythology, but also of pure politics. Um, the Northeast, well, what does one say? I was really hoping to come in earlier because I wanted to hear from Erica and Cynthia. Cynthia, I've heard, Erica, I haven't. Um, but I, I did want to say this, is that um, the pandemic was a classic example, at least the first few uh, weeks or months of the pandemic, when People from the Northeast, they don't all look like me. They look, uh, you know, uh, as if they're of South, from Southeast Asia. The number of health workers and others who were spat upon or abused and called uh, Corona or uh, Chinese virus, things like that, you know, really abusive, something that Donald Trump would use, but there we are. Uh, in many countries, these, uh, these uh, abuses are being, have been thrown about. And uh, I think that um, uh, 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, uh, the situation was such where people from the Northeast now who are holding academic positions in various universities, even if they had been abused by, um, shall we say, mainland uh, Indians, they would not say much, very much. But today there are people like Alana Golmai and others who are much more robust in their advocacy, who are much more organized in their uh, in the mobilization and who are much more articulate in the sense that they speak their minds much more than others did earlier. So people now have to take notice of what people from the Northeast say, especially when it comes to discrimination. I mean, we had this, uh, when I was at Jamia Millia Islamah, we did two, two studies on discrimination against women uh, from the Northeast in, the, in 11 metros, four in the first study and seven in the next. And uh, it was very interesting. There was a kind of contradiction because you had um, 
80% of the women said that they had been harassed in some way or the other. But then a majority of the 80% said they would encourage their relatives, siblings and others to come to Delhi and other metros to work. The, the harassment was worst in Delhi and its environments naturally. But they would encourage people from their own home states to come and live and work and be to study and make a life for themselves here, despite the discrimination, which tells us a different story. It tells us that how challenging conditions are back home. There may not be discrimination, but there's lack of opportunity. So what do you choose? You know, so I think this is the engagement that I think many communities are going through in this, this country of ours and in many countries is that do you, uh, do you just you know, live in your own background in some comfort or discomfort, or do you take a risk and move outside? And uh, there was a time the great uh, political scientist, Myron Wiener, who's really my political guru when it comes to demography, uh, he had said many years ago that uh, in an analysis of the Northeast that the people of Assam, my home state, were the least mobile of all communities in South Asia. Today that is changing. That was true 30 years ago. It's no longer true. So I think that a lot of these stereotypes are being addressed uh, by engagement, by dialogue, by admonition and robust opposition, you know? Uh, and by the fact, you must remember one thing, discrimination in the, in the Northeast uh, is not just related to caste, color, or creed, uh, a large number of the hill uh, communities, the upland communities are Christian. Uh, most of the people in the plains are Hindus and Muslim. But what to me is really interesting is that this is the first area after independence that challenged the idea of India. We challenged it because he said, we are not part of you. We are a different people. We have nothing to do with you. This is, came from Nagas and the Mizos and then uh, later from the Manipuris. But today that has changed. There is engagement. But without the first, the engagement wouldn't have taken place. You know, and the, the engagement is now leading to dialogue. There is no embrace. So I think that is something that we need to be very clear about. That um, in this process um, where uh, uh, you know, the, these challenges came out many years ago. We, we, still have a, we still have a long way to go. And I think one of the things, and I close with that, is uh, uh, yesterday's generation was uh, in a, a time of, for them it was a time of confrontation and conflict, literally physical conflict, armed conflict. Thousands of people have died. Today's generation is engagement. And that engagement takes a different form every day. Every day, they meet discrimination, they engage with it. They meet uh, uh, ignorance, they deal with it. And often the, the rest of India also has to deal with the fact that many people in, in the Northeast perhaps are not as well informed about uh, India as, as, uh, as uh, uh, they would like them to be, would like them to be. So it's a learning curve and I think that uh, there are many other issues too complicated to go into now, but uh, the outsider insider thing is that that uh, asymmetry is is changing to to a degree. I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much, Sanjay. Uh, that was Sanjay Hazarika, who's been kind enough. Uh, literally, uh, was not originally supposed to be a part of this conversation, but I'm so happy that he's part of it, and I think he's more than compensated for the fact that we couldn't have Doctor. Alana Golme of Manipur uh, because of poor internet connectivity to be part of this discussion. And, and uh, uh, if there are any other questions, I don't see any on the chat box, but if anybody wants to ask questions, we've kind of started at 7.30, it's getting on to 9 p.m. in India. I don't know what time it is at Erika, where Erika is in Lesotho, but yeah, it, it was, it's very early in the morning, is it? Uh, it's uh, half past five in the evening. Oh, what fun. Yes, they're on, they're you are on, three and a half hours ahead. Oh, there we go. There we go. They're on, they're on Central European time. 
<laughs> all, right, all right. So, so I'm sorry. I, I, my sense of this timing is not that great. But okay, uh, I don't see any other questions uh, on the chat box. And Nilankur has given an excellent idea. He says he's going to actually show the film unfair after our program is over. Uh, would uh, Cynthia and Erica like to say anything before we conclude our conversation? Cynthia, you have to again unmute yourself. Unmute. That's better. Yeah, I've done that. In this day I'm of sorry. information technology, we have new <laughs> words which we have to learn. Unfollow, unfriend, etc. Please continue. Yeah. yeah. So what we were saying is that uh, uh, it's important to remember the gender aspect of uh, blackness as well. And uh, so there is an in, 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 you know, a very, very important way in which black men are uh, threatened and Dalit men are a threat, seen as a threat to, uh, you know, people of, uh, uh, in the power, in, uh, you know, higher, in the power hierarchy. The women of the, in the higher power hierarchy are, uh, are supposedly at, uh, threat by these either the black men or the Dalit men. So I think that's an important aspect. On the one hand, there's a fear, you know, of blackness uh, where men are concerned. And where women are concerned, the objectification is such that their seen, their, their beauty may not be appreciated, but as sex objects, they are very, very, uh, they are supposed to be very accessible. This kind of objectification and dehumanization is an important part of uh, you know, uh, of the way in which race operates, racism operates rather than race, racism. So the racism and the casteism are an important part of how, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the experience of blackness, of exclusion, uh, of uh, Dalitness and of caste and gender all come together in, in various ways. That's where you will find a large number of Muslim men uh, Dalit men and to some extent Adivasi men in as under trials in prison, they're not charged with anything. They're just there waiting for to be, you know, charged. On the other hand, we have uh, prisons in the U.S., for instance, full of black uh, men uh, there because uh, the system sees them uh, and criminalizes them even as children sometimes. So I just want to. I think highlight uh, this aspect. you've made a very important observation, Cynthia. We see across many so-called uh, uh, developed countries and, and, de and democracies, we see a very, very high, disproportionately high number of those belonging to minority communities in prisons. Uh, in India, the under trials, and, and in, in the United States of America, uh, African-Americans as well as Hispanics. Uh, Thank you very much uh, for your comments, you know, and I just some, like to add one small point before we moved on to Erika. Uh, you know, uh, the four directors of the film, which you're going to see in a very short while from now, we had our own little tiffs and our fights, and, and I had this huge fight with Wensi, and I said, you must show how Bollywood uh, depicts, you know, I mean, the stereotypes that are depicted in Bollywood, which uh, is the sort of uh, it's popular culture. I mean, just as in Hollywood, during the Cold War, all the villains were Russian, and I'm sure in in the uh, in the time to come, all the villains will have will be from the People's Republic of China. But uh, we see the stereotyping. Mahmood, I am to kya hu? I am dil wale hai. And uh, Dilip Kumar, Sagina Mahato. Sala mein to sahab ban gaya. Sahab ban ke aisa ban gaya. Be suit mera dekho. Ye boot mera dekho. Ye gora jaise London ka. Well, very, very popular songs. But again, you see the undercurrent of the, the, the stereotyping, the racism, which is there. Okay, last word from you, Erica. Our guest from Lesotho before we conclude our conversation. For this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so first I would like to begin with um, what you talked about stereotypes. And I would like a platform just like how Indian 
TV has a lot to talk about politics, their economic situations. Why don't we also have a platform that educates the masses about race, about just information about how other countries go about? Because I think it's because of this ignorance that all of these issues will keep happening. And there are issues that are never talked about in India. And I was particularly interested in the fact that I stayed for six years and I never had any issues being discussed about HIV and AIDS, just for instance. And then I wondered, is it because HIV and AIDS does not exist at all in the country? And then I stayed for a particular time where we would never really discuss about racial issues until we were, I was in, in Bangalore, that was in 2016. So is it because we ignore that these issues exist or is it because people are avoid to talk about them for some particular reason? So I just thought about the fact that these stereotypes have to be broken up or has to be clarified to people. How do you make people aware of issues like this? I'm really glad about this platform because it allows us to iron things out and just talk about different experiences. And then I, there was a particular interesting topic that was raised about dealing with discrimination outside your country because at home things are really not well. The, economies, uh, the economic situation is really bad. So I, I, it was interesting when I came to India for the first four years, the discrimination was bad. But when I got a scholarship, I came back because to me, it was more profitable for my own education. And then I had to disregard all the discrimination that I would face or say, you know what, um, just like um, Mr. Har Haraz, sorry, I might get your name wrong. <laughs> Mr. Sanjoy, that's easier. You mentioned something about uh, how today's um, generation is actually more engaging. So I, I actually resonated with that because the way I would take my situation was to say, yes, things are really bad at home, but this is something I can deal with. I can take this into my own, I can inculcate that discrimination for the better good. I'll give an example, the word nigger. Um, we started using it quite often, even in college, in as much as it is, um, derogative term, it was very okay to use it for my own comfort in some sense. I didn't feel very bad when I started saying the word as often as possible because I knew that if I don't use it, if I hear someone else use it to me, I would feel much more pain unless I become more comfortable with it. So it's like being more sarcastic just to make myself feel comfortable around the situation um, that was I was in. And the last point I was wanted to make was about um, skepticism towards um, Africans, especially in India. You'd see that once you see an African man, you would either see a fraudulent person, a thief, an aggressive person, um, before you even think of all the positive aspects, you just become skeptic because of the way they look. Just like um, an Arabic who lands onto um, the American uh, airport and then they just see uh, a terrorist. It is the same as uh, seeing an African and you just see all the negative aspects uh, regarding the person. So um, this platform is really good because we get to talk about these things, but we need more. We have to do more to make people aware and to just educate people because there is, it's clear it's a case of ignorance. People have to be educated regarding all these um, racial issues, especially. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Erica, for being part of our uh, discussion. Uh, a brief comment from me that, you know, Wensi uh, uh, and I and many others, we are thinking that we need to have a kind of a, a live portal because what, what you're going to see in a short while from now, the film is 52 minutes, thanks to the Public Service Broadcasting Trust, which uh, financially supported the making of this film. Uh, uh, you're going to see a 52-minute 52, 52 version of the film but we want to have a portal where we have a lot of information. Uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a film, we take short uh, excerpts from the long interviews that we conduct. We wanted to 
put this as a repository of information, put all the in interviews, put all the links to the various uh, papers, uh, articles. Uh, we want a, a website to be there, which can be updated from time to time, which can be live and which can uh, be there for a long, long time to come. As always, the, the constraint is money. And uh, that's the way our life is. But uh, if all of you are willing to contribute, maybe we can make this uh, a reality. And, and on behalf of THUS, thus, and, and uh, I, I want to thank Erica, uh, I want to thank Cynthia, I want to thank Sanjoy, and once again, express uh, our, reg our regrets that we could not get uh, Alana Gulme on our program. That was uh, our bad luck, our bad, uh, we, just, we just feel bad that we couldn't have that. But uh, thank you all very much for being part of this conversation, which has lasted now for about an hour and 10 minutes. And, and uh, let me hand it over now to Nilankur and let him uh, conclude this conversation. And all of you uh, would know that it's going to be uh, put up on YouTube so it can be viewed by others uh, as and when uh, you want them and you can inform people about that. And, and uh, Nilankur, over thank to you. Thank you. Yes. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Puranjay, sir. And thank you, all the panelists. Sanjeda, thank you for your uh, valuable comments on how we see the otherness in it. And uh, now we are going to see the f uh, film Unfair and Reggie will share the screen. And uh, thank you all for participating and whoever wants to see the film, go ahead, yeah, please. And, and, and those who don't want to see the film now can see it later because it's available on YouTube. They search their place, they say that they kidnapped somebody. The boys were, were crying. The call keep coming and coming and coming. It was Sadiq. Uh, he's a Nigerian. They say that these boys adopted Manish, kill Manish, and eat Manish. So the story at the outset sounded absolutely crazy to me and I could not believe it at first that something like this was possible. The local residents had barged into the home of five Nigerians and checked their refrigerator for pieces of human body parts. No media house was actually willing to believe the story or uh, you know carry any reports on that. When I went there, the people there were more, were more than 4,000 people. 4,000 Indians, and the police were everywhere. I went inside with the police. We searched everything to know whether we were going to see skin parts, human being. How I do this is that I will knock, please. Uh, my name is Charles. I'm the, the vice president. Uh, please, uh, the police want to do their duty. Please allow us. Let them do their, their duty. So the police will search, search the port, search the everything, you know. It was a, an embarrassment, but I thank God none of them uh, took it as embarrassment. And then the next thing we did was to to start putting call to various students to mobilize them. And then we mounted pressure on the police until the five boys were released. You are not bad people. All these things think that you guys are the Police assured us that you know they have found no evidence against these boys. These boys have been falsely accused, and that's why they are releasing them to us. Uh, again, uh, there was no media presence there that day, and uh, the day after that, which was a Monday, the local residents of Greater Noida they took out a counter march to protest the protest by the Africans. <laughs> At that point, we were actually not sure if these uh, images and video needs to be put out 
because the media till that point of time had shown little or no interest in covering the issue. The uh, reporters I was speaking to completely uh, disbelieved that Indians could be racist as well. I think it was near Saranpur. I forgot. It was like Nizapur something. It, the university was local university. It was in construction. And I think we were the first African, or I can say black, to be on that area or maybe that city. Because the experience even didn't uh, give us more opportunity to to perform in our study because it was just too much hurt. Sometimes you just see people, you don't know what they are speaking, they look at you, they are laughing, they are, they are there, so you feel so bad. Even I don't know, it was a joke, but it would, you know, to make me also like participate in your job. You are just in your side. You look at me, you are smiling, you are laughing at me. I, I don't know what you are saying. I can just say why they are laughing at me like this. So when we go near them, they just, I don't know, sometimes go uh, a little bit far from us, you know, so we cannot fall. So I think we feel very lonely, you know, in the first time to be far from your family, your country, your friends, your everything. So you come and you don't like, you, you feel like you are not welcome, you know. They didn't say that. I, it's just the way they behave, the way they are doing the things. It was like, it feel like I'm not home. And uh, days upon day, you feel you are foreign. You say that is not my place. I'm foreign here. You know, you just more days upon days, you just feel like that. Indian upper caste brain and consciousness is racist. And it also becomes casteist. When racism and casteism coexist, it becomes brutally violent. A white racial racist will be only once violent again as the black, but a casteist and racist is constantly violent. But how do they explain today the discrimination of an indigenous animal, which is most economic animal, which does not become respectable if we don't have race consciousness in us. Nobody is questioning cow being sacred animal. Nobody is questioning cow being the animal on which alone we write an essay in our schools. Why black buffalo is not divine, national, respectable animal. And buffalo can be a, a, an animal on which no god can travel, only Yama, the god of death, travels. He's not interesting, are you sure? Uh, you know that, you know that mom told me? Because they are Indian. Yeah, you came out just in the first time to say, you know, I think it's a special that you gave her like 60 years ago. She gave me this, she said you can put it. And she asked me, what can I put? What do you have from Congo that I can put for you? Then she said, 
I've been in uh, Rishikesh, Kochi, Bihar. I've been in Marina Beach, Chennai, Pondicherry. I've been in Nagpur, Bangalore, Jharkhand, Patna, Jalanda, Golden Temple. Um, you know, I mean, many places. You find difference of culture, different people, but mixed as one. So in India, you know, if you are here, you are going to learn what I call the tolerance in the sense. You have to accept, you have to agree that all the people exist, all the religion exists, all the culture exists. You know, that is what I, you know, I got out from, from India. You know, India is amazing. Day by day, I used to learn something, every day. Like, uh, I remember I went to one hospital, then one of the doctors was like, you are from Africa? He said, yeah, which country? I said, Congo. Huh? I heard like, uh, in Africa, you guys are eating humans. I said, yes, I can eat you even if you want. You know, people always say that the uneducated people are the people who are really ignorant, they, they racially discriminate because they do not know, they are backward and everything. But I guess that experience proved everything wrong because as I visited the slum areas, they were much more welcoming. It never strikes to me that I'm black when I'm around this place. Until I go down into the city now, and then I see all those stairs around me. And then I just look around and then I say, oh, by the way, I'm black. <laughs> There's our occupational differences and that difference reflects in uh, your social interaction also. So you can go to the house, but uh, that interaction is not as intimate as, like there's a distinction between how intimately you are interacting with other caste people. Our village is a Muslim populated village, but even then there is, uh, four houses will be from the upper caste and then the houses at the outskirts will be uh, lower caste Muslim houses. And then ekdam or outskirts mein jayenge, to you'll see the lith households, tribal hamlets. So this was the kind of structure which, uh, which I realized later on, ki, oh, that is how the structure of all the villages that I saw growing up were mostly. If you're from a landowning class, you need not necessarily be a Jat or a Jatsik or a Rajput. I mean, whoever owns land feels um, uh, he has the power to, you know, take the law in his own hands. Is somewhere near a Bohar, where uh, a liquor baron and uh, he was angry with two of his old employees and he actually chopped off their hands and legs. One of them has died. What is it that makes him do it? He thinks he has the power to do it. There is a historical background to it. Second, he can get away with it. Land is also about an idea in your head of a certain permanence. I mean, about lineage, about ancestral receivables, all of that. Land is a very complex cultural issue. Land is not a tradable commodity. But did you teach people to negotiate about giving away their a parcel of land which they had been telling for four generations. You land at an airport 35 kilometers away and you get onto a ring road running through, you get onto an elevated highway and you go down to electronic city. You don't link up to the city itself. The other element is what happens to the rest of it, which remains where it is. It remains even more congested because you have taken up the space, the physical space to do these things. The negotiations on the ground were linked to other negotiations in the cultural space. So they could be countered in the cultural space and certain ideas came up, certain beliefs came up from that. And as a result, the spread of those beliefs influenced what is happening on the ground. But as those kind of interactions sort of, uh, I won't say disappeared, but declined to some extent, then the whole uh, negotiation takes place only in the 
on the streets. And that is invariably a more violent process. Because you kind of put these institutions or these, even if for an IT park or something in a village setup or in a rural setup, and it is very difficult to integrate. But interaction means again, I don't know how that interaction would happen if there are two diverse backgrounds. You have these college students who have come here to study for uh, three, four years, and then you have this uh, people permanently there, and very little commonalities between them other than one person providing some resources for the other. As soon as I got home, then I had a phone call and then the person said I shouldn't come out because they're burning a car at the Saptagri school junction and then all Africans are being attacked. We didn't know what was going on. All we had to do was just communicate via WhatsApp. It was very difficult because for days we had to stay in the house without food. You have to call some vendors and then they will come and charge you three times the price of what exactly you're supposed to be buying. All we knew was that the first car had caused an accident and the occupants of the second car were badly beaten up, including a woman who was uh, stripped. The area was in a state of complete tension. There was that, that thing, you know, like how one incident has triggered off a larger, in some sense, social boycott of students in that area. On the other hand, we had the media, which was began by reporting the incident inaccurately, but at least favorably for the Tanzanian students. And subsequently, it went on to say all sorts of things about the girl, about the students, that they actually caused the accident, that the girl is lying. Canada newspapers were also quite terrible. Tanzanian student was brutally assaulted, stripped and paraded naked by an angry mob. Being part of the media, I can confess that there is no such intelligence in this. If, if it's a crime, they would like to build more crime into it rather than create an understanding. Because they want you to consume every segment of news with a certain kind of unreason. Because that's easier. If you start reasoning, then there are a lot of other problems, attendant problems that come. So if you say, for instance, any local channel had held a, a panel discussion on race relations and brought both sides and held, make them negotiate and tell them that we'll all be friends from tomorrow, you think that would have fetched you numbers or showing repeatedly the lynching of a lady and the burning of a car, what would get you numbers? When the locals are involved and there is a perennial issue is going on, it is a kind of first degree outburst. If you are not able to approach this issue, this is going to be one of the very serious law and order issue in Bangalore city. For African students are our guests. They are a student. They are coming from Africa, they are in India, that too in Bangalore, they are studying purpose. It is our duty to protect them. It is our duty to educate them. It is our duty, if at all anybody involves in illegality, illegal crime, it is our duty to arrest them. We cannot see entire African students as a criminal or any negative mentality. You can decide that, okay, I'm, not, I'm, I'm going back to my country. It wouldn't change anything. But if you say, okay, it happened. Let me try and educate people that this, that happened to me as an example, is not good. You can start not from the, like talking to the local people, from the people in your class. When it happens instantly, anybody, anybody will have that pain. Anybody would have that, like that aggression, like I hate these people, it's there. But the thing is that, how long can you hate? We live in a time now where these eruptions are more and more possible because the, the things that cause these eruptions are less and less uh, nuanced. Today it can be black, tomorrow it can be deep eating, tomorrow it can be walk on the wrong side of the road. The boundary keeps moving, the line every day keeps moving to what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Or it's up to an individual to figure out how they get treated.
it, it needs to be them saying that today I got pointed and laughed at or whatever and tomorrow I might get pointed and laughed at but the next day the auto man will say hello to me and I will be pointed and laughed at. It's not going to change the pointed and laughed at. What is going to change is that more and more people are going to smile at you. More and more people are going to say hello to you. More and more people are going to think it's okay for you to be around. That's what's important. Yes, there is going to always be that one person who goes, ah, ah, ah. That's not going to change. How can that change? Asking people not to have difference, or people not to see difference, or people not to like people because of like petty things. People don't like people for petty things all the time. Came around and vampire them, extract them taxes in a gums or wars. No one is companies follow them, same old tactics. Politics is working for them, and media, media is working for them. Police working for them, no talk is working for them, and money and violence is working for them. We get a lot of foreign students to come here and study, uh, but I don't think there is proper preparation before you get those two. Are the Indian students told about the students who come from abroad? How much is the assimilation? How much is the interaction between these students? I don't think they are there. Uh, you, you're even catering to their needs. So where do they go? They go out, they go into the market. The market is not prepared to receive them. So they could run into problems. Especially when some Indians like are looking at him, you know, in that weird way or whereby people are surprised, like they've never seen an African before. He really gets angry. Because you know, some, sometimes uh, those days him, when we came, when we came, they, you know, they, they look too much. You, know, you can find that, you know, you are on the, maybe you are even on the bus. You want to sit. Someone can't even leave a seat for you because they are surprised to see you, you know. So, so you find that, you no, know, yeah, the seat is there, there's a seat, there's no one. And they just said, no, you can't sit here. I'm waiting for a girl to come, to come and sit here. It's not possible. It's a public transport. Everyone who comes early will sit. Yeah, so also that one, I don't understand. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who I can talk to about that. So most of the people are hanging out in the different uh, uh, try to be together and share problems. The short time they are getting, they are being together, gathering together. We have also some uh, church. There is a lot of activities. They are playing football. There are exams. Before exam, there are some uh, tests. So we can say that uh, there is no time of hanging out. It was Burundians who were going to the Congolese parties. A birthday of one of the friends we, we knew. For very excitement, uh, Yannick was calling, saying that, uh, where are you, are you reaching, when are you reaching? It was kind of, he was taking some meal near Taj. It was in Jalanda, we were near Ramamandi, so we were taking some much time. So he said, I'm going to wait them to the venue, so you, you shall join me later. And then that's when the tragedy happens while he was going to to the party. Char para the which man choking charge bus stand the which then I see you can be no rat no quick cream it was a at all I believe no can a jog away we can get to the coffee matra the which Johnny can get a cool the last eight to put the photo margarita so did the bottle on beer the bottle on the whole इतना दिन आ रहा काफी मात्रा चल किती की काफी कून होते था बोला काफी कून कर बाहर ऐसी एक बस स्टैंड के पास में किका किसे लड़की नू कमेंट्स कर देतो मुमली जी चल रहा है पंच मारने के बाद इनमें टूटू मैं मैं ही हूँ जी ऑटो में बैठ के It is only on Monday where a message was conveyed to everybody that we shall meet at Ori Hospital. 
in Yalanda. And that's the first time all Burundians, none left home. Everybody was there. And he was coming from some scanning. And then that he passed by. He passed that's, by. That's when we saw that. He passed by with a very huge bandage, like this. Someone inconscient. He was even inconscient. Don't think that uh, he's he alive or will he survive? Oui, je je voudrais dire que bon, c'est bien que ce film soit diffusé, mais qu'il sert d'exemple parce que perdre une vie, une vie, c'est c'est quelque chose de grave. Il faut que les gens apprennent par ce film qu'il faut respecter la vie de, de chacun. Parce que d'une part, personne n'y gagne. Personne n'y gagne. On perd plus tôt. On perd des amis, on perd un enfant. Je souhaite que ce film puisse servir aux autres. Les gens sont égaux. Il faut qu'on évite le racisme. Ça ne paye pas, ça ne sert à rien. When we came, we were like, we also want to know, we were like, talk to him, where we go, we were uh, try to, to know people and the late people know you. Then after, all this, then you start, you know, living by your, uh, your own and uh, even if you meet with someone who really wants to, to know you, and we try to be like, is it safe? It should not be incumbent upon students to integrate themselves with the local population. Why should they have to go out of their way to do charity? Great if they do. But even if a student did not do any of these things, even if he or she came to India just to study, get a degree and leave, it should be fine. On their backs and on their through their pockets, an entire local economy thrives. So the landlord benefits, the shopkeeper benefits, the colleges benefit, universities benefit, the police benefit. FIRO gets hundreds and hundreds and thousands of rupees and fines from all of these students. And after they've given away all their money, they go back to their home countries. We see them as a vessel to be drained dry. We don't see them as human beings who have come here to study. Though, see, this is a sick majority state, Punjab, now. But uh, the same problem of casteism is as deeply embedded and exclusion is as strong as in any other uh, Hindu states. I think this telling that Ikalavya and seat of learning, it was only for a handful of people, for Pandas, for Brahmins. Ordinary people were not supposed to know anything of knowledge. In that sense, what constitutes knowledge is already a product of power relations. But what is driving this association is simply brute empirical association, which endures, that is to say, we have hardly any rich, powerful people who are also unquestionably dark. Good evening with you on a prop-up worldwide from PRI, Public Radio International. And we are listening to Senegalese American pop star Akon singing in Hindi. Yes, you heard right. The song is Chalak Chalo and it's the lead number from the 2011 sci-fi Bollywood hit Ra One. Ekon's Bollywood debut must have been especially exciting back home in Senegal, where Hindi film music is massively popular, I tell you, everywhere you find it. It's just one example of the many musical and cultural connections between Africa and India. <laughs> Now, 
जंगल में ऐसे ही पहनता होंगे ऐसे ही लोग पहनते हैं तो ये बना दिया when the arab merchants they brought this uh, tribes from africa so they try to sell out in different areas of india say for example the central province and the western province it is called hafsis and uh, when they settle down in gujarat it is called the siddhis ye nidan ka badi baat bana chala hai laje humko thoda rehne ke aise jagah de diye samjhe उसके बाद निजाम साहब अब तक पूछते नहीं ना पूछाते अभी एक साल में दो गादा होता है तो उनके फंक्शन में बुलाते फंक्शन कर लेते कुछ दिए दे दिए वहाँ से हटा जाइए कुछ ना कुछ करने के ना तो आने के अभी जो भी दिए निजाम साहब ये रखे हुए आए घर टुकड़े समझे इसको रजिस्ट्री नहीं थी फिर उन पैसे से रजिस्ट्री मेहनत मजदूरी करके काम होटलों में इधर उधर करके करा गया रजिस्ट्री करा As far as I know, the histories like that, our Sindhi people have come from across from the Ethiopia and uh, Zambia, and uh, then Portuguese left them here only, and they went back. These people are uh, having no passports or nothing, or nothing, so they went in the forest pockets to survive. Ahmedabad ke bichu bich mein hum log rehte, lekin old Ahmedabad mein saare area mein hum log ko jaante. सिद्धिस है सिद्धि बादशाह लोग यहाँ रहते लेकिन जब हम ब्रिज क्रॉस करके हम लोग जाते न्यू अहमदाबाद में जैसे कि सीजी रोड आश्रम रोड नवरंगपुरा वहाँ पे कोई हम लोग को जानता ही नहीं था बल्कि हम लोग 300 साल से अहमदाबाद में ही रह रहे सदियों से हमारे यहाँ बहुत लोग आए हमारे पास रहे बहुत सी कहानियाँ लिखी लेकिन आखिरी लाइन में उन्होंने हमें गुलाम ही क्यों बनाया एक्चुअली मेरा नाम है कमला कमला बाबू सिद्धि मतलब मेरा डैडी का नाम पहले बाबू है तो मैं एक्चुअली मंचीगेरी चिकोत्ती बोल के एक छोटा सा गांव है वहाँ पे पढ़ी हूँ स्कूल के बाद ये लोग क्या करते थे हम लोगों को लेके जाके ग्राउंड में चार पांच चक्कर लगाते थे तो वहाँ पे एक दिन मैं बोले कि नहीं यहाँ पे अल्लाहपुर में सिलेक्शन है बड़े बड़े लोग आए आप लोग जाइए बोल के तो इनविटेशन आया तो हम लोगों को जितना भी बच्चे से सब भी सर ने लेके गए फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम 350 चिल्ड्रन असेंबल्ड इन अल्लाहपुर स्कूल एंड 65 चिल्ड्रन 40 हैव गॉन अप टू द इंटरनेशनल एंड नेशनल लेवल इन डिफरेंट डिसिप्लिनस सबको सिखाने को हम स्ट्रेंथर to make us more interested in that field when this started happening and we are start athletic arena we are start to dominate then um, all karnataka they started discriminating very unfortunately the other inmates of the sai center even the office staff of the sai center they ridiculed this african look children of india 
and they always treated them as if they are come from other country like Nigeria and Kenya. Somehow or other, they started feeling homesick, and ultimately, due to poor management also, the center was closed and children were sent back. So, if, for example, uh, one can show, and I don't know if it's been shown, that in Africa there are these biological traits or genetic traits that uh, promote endurance, where lung capacity is be better, and therefore these people can, uh, you know, run for longer distances, etc. We can probably train them to become more endurant, and therefore run longer distances. Earlier, we used to go to the village, see their parents, see their brothers and elder brothers, elder sisters to what height it has gained, whether this boy of 12 years and 14 years, whether he will grow to that height or not. Now by saliva you can tell ki whether he will become a sprinter or not. That doesn't necessarily mean, or that never means, that the gene variant is responsible for doing the menial kind of work that they are doing, or that they are preordained at birth because they have inherited this genetic form, that they are preordained to do menial, menial kind of work. The imposition of uh, this mental construct of superiority and inferiority is uh, complete nonsense because if anybody has to be superior, it has to be the Africans because they are our ancestors. Uh, I was playing uh, somewhere in West Africa, in Benin Republic to be precise, second division team. So after the game that day, the guy called me and said, What's your name? Where are you from? I have a contact in India. I'm taking you to India. I said, India? He said, yes. I said, okay. And uh, the day at the airport, when I was, the day I was flying, I asked him, which team am I going to play? Which team am I going in India? Because we were two, two of us. And he wrote one name in the piece of paper and gave to me. And I looked at it. The name he wrote for me, it's East Bengal. Istanbul is uh, 80,000 people. It was a big city, one of the best cities in, in, in the world. You know, it's cosmopolitan. And uh, I was playing against Fenerbahce. And uh, the captain from Fenerbahce was the legend in Turkey. He's a good player, good player. Emre Bilazo. You know? And you can say something wrong and bad. But how long? You know, this is for me. It was, I was surprised. You can't tell to me, go your country. This is, I didn't understand, you know? And uh, I always take my, my calm, be patient, say nothing. Because my mind, I know what I can do for the next game. And I show him for the next game what I can do. Yeah, I don't speak too much. I show him, and this is, this is was unbelievable, you know? India has got two problems. One is caste problem. Second is a fair and lovely problem. Because only fair looking people are the gentlemen. All blackies are not human beings. When we go to the village, we sit in bus, so if there is वो तीन सीट रहता है तो तीन सीट में तो ब्राह्मण्स बैठते हैं ना बिल्कुल छोड़ के नहीं देते जानपुर्ज की और ये कुछ पेपर रख देंगे क्योंकि उनका आदमी बोलेंगे इस जगह है क्या पूछेगा तो नहीं नहीं हमारे आदमी आने वाले आने वाले नहीं रहते लेकिन उनका कोई भी आएगा तो हाँ हमारा आदमी बिल्कुल बैठा देंगे मेरे को ही हुआ लास्ट ईयर अरे वो सब लोग बोलते हैं कि वो देखो 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 स्टिल दे डोंट नो माय नेम स्टिल दे आर डोंट नो आई एम फ्रॉम इंडिया Okay, now uh, like you say talk to them, uh, okay I'm from, uh, you say okay, I'm Indian and you have finished talking all the good shit about yourself and all your introduction is over, then the person again asks you, uh, <laughs> did you go back to your country? <laughs> did you go back to your country? Oh, which country do you want me to go back to? <laughs>
मैं कारोबार से बोलता हूँ तो वो उसको सोचता है कि वो अरे कोई कंट्री है मैं इसलिए बोलना पड़ता है गोवा से लेकिन मोहन मेरे सामने खड़ा है तभी बोलता है गोवा से कहीं चले तुम When I started playing football, when I went to play, I think so it was under 16 nationals in uh, Orissa, and the Punjab coach was there, and the fourth official was from Manipur. He went to the fourth official. He said he is not Indian, and the match was about to start. I was already inside the ground. The referee came running. Where are your documents? That is where problem come. Problem come in visa and passport. That newspaper bring it that uh, they have started playing football in the Assamjel history done by Henry. So after then everybody came to know that football is going on in the jail. And after then Emily came. He spoke to Superintendent of Police that they should take me to the Delhi to make my passport with escort. And they they should bring me back to the Assam again for the coaching job. But the MLA told me do not inform the media that you have no visa. He told me you tell them you have visa, you have passport. I spent one year, one year twenty days. This is the second time. First time eight months. Second time one year twenty days. Attention, please. This is the final call. Now, what do you what do we call racism? Racism means you you know putting the boundaries between you and someone because the person is not like you. So it happens everywhere, but it depends on the gravity of it. Racism is every, even in Nigeria. Is, it is there is people from the west end don't want to mix up with people from the east. The Christians don't want to mix up with the Muslims. So racism. Man. Any black guy on the street, you just say Nigeria. I said, no, 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 no. Don't mistake. It could be from Ghana. It could be from Ivory Coast. It could be from Kenya. It could be from anywhere. Congo. He's not Nigerian. They say, no, no, no. Nigeria, the whole Africa is Nigeria. I said, no, no, it's not. Nigeria is just one part of Africa in the western side. And that's it. Origin of human was. In Africa, about 160,000 years back. So from there, people have migrated to other continent and colonized. Whatever the characteristic features we have, either uh, eye color or hair color, the way we speak, the way we walk, everything is coded in our DNA. There is a specific mutation which made our skin color from dark to light. And there is this pigmentation on the skin that will allow so much of sunlight to get in, and depending on the extent of sunlight that there is in the environment, this is all controlled by a pigment called melanin. And there's been a series of adaptations because, in, depending on which particular area or region of the earth you are, that region of the earth, if it gets more sunlight, then you need less penetration. If there is less sunlight, you need more penetration, and so on and so forth. So this, uh, you know, the skin being extracted from Nepali women, it's also based on a horrible misconception. What the traffickers do is they say that we we are going to provide you the best quality skin because they, you know they they get skin from fair Nepalese women. As you come towards the Tirai, you know you'll get dark skinned women. When you go upward, you'll find women who have a lighter skin tone. It's mainly because of the sun rays. So that's how the traffickers also operate in terms of skin. It's used in almost every aesthetic surgery that happens, be it penis enlargement, breast enhancement, uh, nose job, lip job. It's 100 square inch, 10 into 10 square inch of skin. The international value of that uh, piece is 2 lakh to 2.5 lakh. So we black people have, certainly we have skin color issues. Um, you know, we, uh, Nigeria is the second largest skin bleacher 
uh, for Black Nation uh, in the world. But fundamentally, what's happening is people are changing what they think is not wanted, what they feel is uh, is, is unappreciated, and trying to alter their bodies so that they look uh, a way that they feel is great. I've had people tell me, "Won't you consider bleaching your skin?" And I'm thinking, for what? I've never been in a boardroom and people don't listen anywhere in the world. I've never walked into a room. Maybe they'll judge me at first because she's fat and she's dark and what could she possibly have to say? But by the time I open my mouth, I, I've never had anyone not come and line up to talk to me. So I don't feel the need to change anything. And Indians conventionally and down the generations have believed that fair skin is better, is more beautiful, is more desirable. I think uh, this is uh, this is a very deep-rooted belief in Indian society. So, if you have darker skin and you want your skin to be brighter, fairer, then some manufacturer comes along to meet your requirement. What Fair and Lovely has done is that they are trying to meet a human need. It's been actually constructed and spoon-fed to us, saying this is exotic, that's normal, that's ugly. Everything germinates from that. That's your core idea and what are they trying to sell. So we cast according to that, we find locations according to that, we start putting together production costs according to that, and then we shoot. A large number of creative people, large number of marketing people, stylists, photographers, you know, directors. There's a huge ecosystem who actually gives you that image, right? The original idea, it starts from saying, okay, this pattern is working. Where girls, girl go to an interview, get rejected, she go to the loop, put some fair, fair and lovely, come back and she get the job. And then on top of that, they will get like movie star. And then even if the idea is really pathetic, it will always work. You know, you just put the name of, you know, or the face of some, some beautiful girl and it's all over. You were given a certain kind of medium where the medium required a certain kind of skin tone, a certain skin gamma, where the woman's face would approach white. Ideally, it should approach not alabaster white, but the next shade. You know, you have to sound politically correct, so no one will uh, pitch it like that. It's very, it's couched in different kind of language. Earlier, it was na na na, moila na. Moila means dirty. So the word color is used in Sanskrit in the sense of Varna. So Varna means color or Varna means light. Now this word occurs in the Rugveda in the sense of some color. Which color is it that they are not clear? And so the word color is associated with Dasa. The word color is associated with Asura in Vedic literature. And in later course of time, the word color changed its meaning to Jati or caste and therefore in the Rugveda or in Vedic text the word Brahmana Varana is used. Sometimes in the Mahabharata also the word Brahmana Kshatriya Vaishya Shudra Varana is used. But the, the sense over there is not just a specific color but a community having certain origins. So the word Varana moved to Jati. So historically there is some kind of relationship between Varana and Jati. Which comes first? Is it that we develop stereotypes based on prejudice we already hold? Or is it that we are only, we are the society, the modern society creates uh, stereotypes which we consume from which prejudice comes? Actually, the stereotype actually emanates from this kind of impossibility to become one. So the prejudice, the, the birth of prejudice takes place only in the limits of one's, one's own. I can't become like that, so I have to offer this. Everybody stereotypes in every single country. You will find that people use the what is foreign, what is from the outside, as a stereotype. When you want to render a place weak, you have to split people from one another. You have to 
you have to make them fight with each other or you have to make them see their differences, you know? So it's often like that with stereotypes. When you don't like them, you start, when, they, when they hurt you, you start to be against them. But when they can serve you, you deliberately play them. And I think everybody does that. You know, in the industry over here, the standard is fair, long hair. You know, and I'm the exact opposite of that. Although I do have the height, I do have the body, but I'm, I'm dark skin. But the way the world is going, how everyone is trying to control the other person or position the other person, I think it's like almost like we're trying to make turn each other into mannequins, you know? Where I can just put this mannequin's hand, okay, can't put his hand up. <laughs> put his hand up and it just stays that way. Or do something to its body and it just stays that way. But the thing is, we're not mannequins, no, we're human beings. And there's just so much going on. There's too much going on inside us. You see me, you see a black girl, you see an African, African woman or a black girl. You don't see a human being. Why? I am a human being. You are a human being as well. I saw something on Snapchat. Somebody was warning every every one of us Africans, don't go outside. It's it's really bad out there. Some of my friends started telling me, don't come to the college. There's a lot of noise here. And I went to Facebook and I saw horrible things. And people were African boys were being beaten up. They were being accused of, you know, eating that Indian boy or killing him and eating him or something like that. That time there are this gang of Indians going into their apartments, checking their properties, their fridges. So it was a little bit frightening. What what about my security? What about my safety? This is something something that was not condemned. Something the government didn't do anything about as in the awareness, these are people, people are being attacked in your country. You don't make any awareness about it. What do you expect? That means you have emboldened the local people. You might walk by, some Indian Indians might pass by, and you might hear them saying, Maru, 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 Maru. Yeah, something like that. I mean, beat, beat, right? So it's really... When, when we think about uh, caste, or when we think about uh, sensitivity to color more generally, uh, it is alignment with privilege that is at work. Because we are a caste society, we go by this Hindustani term called Aukat. And Aukat is at heart a relational thing. You can't have Aukat for a single individual. Aukat is always your standing relative to someone else. And these people of another race become available for the staging of relative superiority. For me, I'm not, I'm not angry at a very direct racist. Because he's direct. He's not hiding, he's not consolidating it. He's just, you know, straight up. Listen, I don't think, I don't like you. I'm not comfortable right now. Done. He's making it very obvious. But in a lot of times, if, if you're just an ignorant person that doesn't really believe anything, but just knows, you know, stereotyping or, or, or grew up thinking that, you know, people from certain ethnicity we should not talk to. I don't blame him, you know? But a lot of people, if he doesn't know anything, he just, he just doesn't, if he's just racist against you, sometimes he just, his perception of different, like he, he doesn't accept you as a different looking person. And during this era, when we're witnessing a huge, a huge crisis of immigration, we're witnessing uh, what you might call the revenge of the history of colonization. And you speak about uh, violent reactions to African students in, here in India. And so I think it's so important to recognize that even groups that are targeted by racist strategies are not themselves immune to the appeal of racism. And that includes all of us. Uh... 
Who taught you to hate the texture of your hair? Who taught you to hate the color of your skin to such an extent that you bleach to get like the white? Who taught you to hate yourself from the top of your head to the soles of your feet? Who taught you to hate your own kind? So much so that you don't want to be around each other. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.